strong energy drink for your mind. I'm your host, Rochelle Henry. I'm Rico E. Anderson. And I'm Sasha Kerbel. As always, 60 minutes of high voltage conversation are on the way. So get ready to supercharge your brain. He's an Emmy Award winning director and producer. He's a host and creator of the national PBS show, The Artist Toolbox, which has an estimated viewing audience of 3 million people. He's also directed, produced, and written numerous award-winning films, directed over 30 stage plays with such talents as Sandra Bullock, Marsha Gay Harden, Eli Wallach, Scott Bakula from Quantum Leap, Star Trek, and NCIS New Orleans, uh, Jill Eckenberry, Bernard Shaw, Linda Hunt, John Shea, and Yardley Smith from The Simpsons. All right. He's also worked on Broadway under the legendary director Hal Prince. He co-founded the Film School of Seattle. He teaches master classes in acting, directing, writing all around the country in institutions such as the University of Washington, UCLA, Seattle University, Cornish College of the Arts, Seattle Central Community College, and Freehold Theater. That is art, it's discovery. They get a lot of wine, it takes a lot of patience, it takes a lot of time to prepare. It's just important, that's what the world is, is about. I'm John Jacobson, and welcome to the Artist Toolbox. Tom's a very gifted actor whose career spans 45 years. You cannot rely on luck at all. Luck comes your way only if you put yourself out there. We're back in New York, this time to talk to the hot David Garrett. It's not often that a classical violinist is called hot, but when you see him, you'll understand why he receives such adoration. Nobody's going to take the bullet for you. You're taking the bullet for yourself. But uh, I wouldn't want it any other way. There's a magic to great art. I'm a great artist. We are in Beverly Hills at the Saban Theater where we're going to meet Jason Alexander. Nobody needs an actor. You need a doctor. You need a lawyer. You need a lot of things. You don't need an actor. Meet another great artist. This time, the fashion designer, Zhang Toy. Don't follow everybody else. It becomes so boring. But this isn't somebody's waste, is it? No, this is not the way that John. <laughs> it's like making love with a manual. It's better to improvise. I'm still on the table of contents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The legendary jazz pianist, Ramsey Lewis. It's the expression of the feeling that you have at that moment. Meet two of the greatest designers in the world, Leila and Massimo Vignelli. Whatever you do, if it's not understood, it's wasted time. The internationally acclaimed architect, Hugh Newell Jacobson. I opened my office 51 years ago. It's just a wonderful process as you try and communicate what is the right thing to do. Today we're going to interview Sam Gilliam, one of the most prominent abstract painters in the United States. We're here to see Irina Dvorvenko and Maxime Veloskerkovsky, principal dancers for the ABT Ballet Company. One of the world's greatest chefs, Daniel Ballou. Isabel and Ruben Toledo, who represent a quarter century of great design and brand building. I feel things and then I somehow give it form or give it shape. I think we are not afraid to follow our heart, to do things that we really love. People look and judge you every day of your life, whether you're on stage or you're off stage. This is who we are. Yes. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, was that something. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, John Jacobson. Thank you. Good to see you. Really happy to have you on the show today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on, John. Um, I'd like you all to know that John is actually uh, my mentor. I've known him since I was 11, and he means so much to me. He's taught me not only acting, but directing and writing, and has also given me so many great life lessons as a person. And there's so many times in life where I refer back to his advice. Um, John means a lot to me, so I'm so grateful that you're on with us today. Everyone, including me, when they first meet you, they assume that you are probably related to the Kennedys because of that hair. Now, I know that you have the best Ethel Kennedy story. Please tell it so Rico and Sasha and our audience can know what I'm talking about. Oh my God, I should have never told you those stories. <laughs> it's my favorite. And first of all, it might be hard because my hair is now so like four months COVID out of control. You know, 
Um, although I, I Kennedy -like, really, like folks. Yeah, maybe another time. But I have heard that all my life. And, you know, I grew up in D.C. where and I went to school with some of the Kennedys. I went to St. Albans uh, and which was a prep school. So a lot of the Kennedy boys were there and the Bush kids were there, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so I knew some of them and, you know, casually. Uh, so <laughs> to show uh, how I would take advantage of that situation, since people were saying I looked like a Kennedy sometimes, I would somehow get a date in high school and then I would take a young lady to a restaurant. And of course, because I was a boy, I would never, I would never think plan ahead to make a reservation at that restaurant. And it'd be Saturday night, so we'd walk in and it'd just be full of people, you know, and I'd walk up to the, you know, the snobby maitre d' and I'd say, hi, can we get a table for two? And he'd go, no, we're completely full. And I'd go, oh, okay, well, can I leave my name? Yes, fine, what's your name? And I'd say, Kennedy. I'd always it'd be like, 10 minutes later, we'd get a table. 10 minutes later, we'd get a table. So I did that, and you know, then I'd have to explain to the young lady I really was not a Kennedy, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, <laughs> so I did that, but embarrassingly enough, I was still doing that when I lived in New York at 25 years old. Okay, so now I'm an adult. I should know better. But hey, it still got me tables at good restaurants in New York. So this one time we got in, and the waiter was at the front, and he looked up and said, okay, and sat us in the restaurant. Then I was, we were having our dinner, my date and I. And then the maitre d' walked up, and he said, uh, you're in Kennedy, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> and he said, it's so great, because your mother, Ethel, she's right in the next oh. room. Oh, no. But, you know, Ethel has 13 children, so I just got up, walked over, gave her a kiss on the cheek, said, hi, Mom, talked to her for a couple minutes, and went back, and she never knew the difference. So. <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, that's pretty bold right there, right? <laughs> that would have been bold, yeah. <laughs> I think she would have known her children. <laughs> Probably so, yeah. So you won an Emmy for your series, The Artist Toolbox, which people can see on PBS. Could you maybe tell us about how that series came to be and how did you choose the artists that you were going to interview? Because you have so many, you know, John Legend and Zhang Toy, so many fascinating artists. Like so many things in life, you know, I, I say that artists have to work super hard. You have to be prepared when the opportunity arises so that when the opportunity does come, which comes sometimes just out of luck, you can execute. Acting is really like that, isn't it? Like you work so hard, you train so hard, and then all of a sudden you have an audition on a piece of material that is pretty breathtaking. And you get it. And if you're not ready, you're not going to get cast in that role. So, you know, we just don't know when that's going to happen, when that right person's going to be there to hear our music or a publisher's going to be inclined to see what we really do. And so um, I had done a commercial and the producer of that commercial, the client of that commercial, you know, befriended me. We became sort of casual friends. And he said he uh, wanted to do something important in his life he was quite wealthy if he if i had an idea what would that be and i said well you know i think television is a really powerful medium i think television is vastly underused for education and and for arts and i think nobody is talking about the process of creation the process of creation really fascinates me how do we create how do we approach our work what is the process not the result we have a lot of shows oprah that talks about the results of stars, you know, oh, you're performing here, oh, you have this album here. But what is the creative way of doing that? And he, just by luck, liked that idea. So he started to finance a pilot, and we just made one show, and I directed it. And he suggested I host it. I'd never done that before, but I could talk about art. I think that was my forte. I, I just have spent my whole life talking about art. And... Uh, so I could get access in this case to um, Tom Skerritt. Tom and I started the film school together along with some other people uh, back in 2003, which is a, was a, a film school, really, really unique, uh, three weeks, six hours a day, 12 hours a day place, just for writers, no filming involved, just writing. So it was a really different kind of school and it was a huge success. Anyway, so Tom and I have become friends through that. Tom is a local actor, but he's done a lot of big movies too, Aliens, et cetera, et cetera. And so we made this pilot, and then uh, the financing partner and I put a trailer together and uh, shopped it around at people to PBS. We, we just didn't think network was going to go for it. We couldn't figure out where that was going to be. Um, and uh, PBS, and she, so the way PBS works is you have to find a sponsor, a local PBS station with national contacts. So there's only like 10 of those in the United States that can underwrite your show. 
And so uh, we went to New York, uh, Boston, Portland, a couple others, and um, all of them wanted to do the show, which was lovely, but the best arrangement and deal and, and relationship we felt was coming out of Chicago, WTTW. Uh, and so we struck a deal with them. They greenlit us for a season and off we went. So from there, it became a matter of, oh, now we have a TV show, we have no guests. So Zhang Toy is a haute couture designer in New York. Uh, my wife used to be the head of a couture at Nordstrom. So she was a buyer traveling around the world to all the great designers. So she knew a lot of these great designers and she'd become good friends with Zhang. So I had become friends with Zhang through her. And so I called Zhang and said, oh, yikes, I got this show. You're an amazing artist, which he is. Uh, would you be my next guest? And so Zhang, we then flew to New York, shot that. That's not cheap, but shot Zhang. And, and the show, we spent two days with these people. It wasn't like a three-hour interview. I went to their house. I went to their, uh, for six hours. I went to their workplace for six hours. We walked their neighborhoods. We went to the places that influenced them or things they felt they wanted to show us having to do with the process of art. Like, this artist really influenced me. I want to go talk to him or I want to show you his work or her work, that kind of thing. And Zhang loved doing the show, and he's a big-hearted person. So then he recommended a slew, because he designed for such major stars. So he knew everybody. He just knew these people. So he just called them, and they loved him, and said, uh, you've got to do the show. So that just started opening those doors for us. And then once we started getting really big names, you know, then all of a sudden people like John Legend, and the show started getting very good ratings, you know. If Charlie Rose, who was on at the time, was in 75% households in America, we were on at 72%. That's mm -hmm. a huge number for a first-year show. So we were doing really well, and people were responding to it. And the lovely thing, it wasn't just artists. It was about all of us who need to hear about the importance of art and also about the importance of process, not result. I think America teaches us to embrace only results. Oh, he's rich. Yeah. Mm, the process is what we're going through every day to try to get to that stage, perhaps. And so I think people caught on to that and like that part of it. So, you know, that's how that sort of happened. And yes, there are a lot more artists. You know, the, the, the show ran for a good amount of time, but the, the problem was the uh, investor who was great that way just finally began to realize, I'm not making any money back. Which we had had that conversation at the beginning. I said, you know, PBS doesn't pay you for your show. They underwrite the show but you have to go out and raise a lot of the money yourself and where are you going to get that money back because it's not cheap what we're doing we're traveling across the country with a film crew for five days and that's and then editing for a month so and he said don't worry about it we're going to get on the show and the money's going to come and i was like okay i'm in this business i'm not sure it works that easily and that's why you see a lot of cooking shows for instance on pbs because with a cooking show you can sell plates glasses food ovens, stoves, microwaves, kitchen design. There's a lot of uh, companies that will underwrite your show to pay for that. But our show, the artist toolbox, which you could argue was a design flaw, but I don't know how else to do it. We talked to artists in all different fields. We talked to Jeff Lethem, the floral designer from Paris. We talked to uh, Sylvia Weinstock, the cake designer in New York. We talked to uh, Daniel Ballou, the chef. We talked to directors, writers, the lead dancers of the American Ballet Theater, actresses, actors. So we were just the whole gamut because I maintain that art finds its way in a lot of different forms, not just the most obvious forms. But that meant that there was no underwriter for that show. Like a painting company, might, like Michael said, well, we'd love to do your art episode, but we don't want to do the ballet episode. So it just we just ran out of money. We just could not keep that engine going, unfortunately, even though it won three, three Emmys, so. Wow, it's a brilliant series though, and I encourage all of our audience to go and check it out. So you can find the whole, all the shows up on Indie Flicks. We are here with John Jacobson, and we will be right back after showing another clip of his work. I've always had this desire to perform in front of audiences, and I started at a very young age. Today, we're on the Lower East Side of Manhattan at the home of the chart-topping, platinum-selling singer, John Legend. What makes an artist, by your definition? What is an artist? Well, I think an artist is someone who loves to create. An artist is someone who's trying to find beauty and create beauty. You want something that you want to listen to a bunch of times and, and pick it apart and, 
and think about what the, the lyricist was trying to say. There are a lot of perhaps very talented musicians out there or artists who it doesn't move quite so quickly for. What would yeah. you say to them? Just be in a constant mode of trying to uh, improve yourself. So uh, whether you're a painter, whether whatever you do, uh, you have to have that drive and that desire to be a better artist. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up and how did they, how that impact the artist that you are now? Uh, I grew up in Washington, D.C. Uh, and lived there. And that's actually an interesting question about how that impacted me as an artist because my dad was a, uh, a major United States modern artist, uh, an architect and really one of the top 50 architects in the world. Um, and so he just lived and breathed art with a capital A and just in our house all the time were just a variety of musicians and painters and poets and of course architects, as well as politicians and reporters, because uh, I grew up in DC. So it was a really great way uh, to be exposed to the arts and long debates. And dad just really walked into buildings and just saw the history of those buildings. And he was so good, his eye was so good that he just pushed that, uh, desire to create and to help and to change very strongly into me. Anyway, so I, I did that and then I uh, um, went to college in uh, Washington and Lee in Virginia, uh, which is now having severe debates about changing the name of their school, which is should happen and we'll see what happens. And then I went, uh, my first job was as an actor at the uh, Alley Theater in Houston, Texas, uh, right out of college. I got cast in my, uh, senior year and then for the fall season I went to Houston, Texas. Um, and the Alley's their big theater there, sort of like the arena is in Washington or the public is in New York, like many other theaters in New York, et cetera, or the taper is in LA. Um, so I did a season there, which is only worth mentioning because I was really never a very good actor and I never really wanted to be an actor. I only wanted ever to be a director, but I wanted to act to learn to be a better director. And that was, um, a really lucky choice on my part. I think I was taught that in college um, uh, because I really value my acting training so much as a better way to teach acting, but definitely a better way to direct. And I'm a writer also, so a much better way to communicate uh, in my screenplays when I'm writing. So I did a season there and then I uh, came back to, uh, to Washington DC and I did a season at the Folger Shakespeare Theater, which is now called the National Shakespeare Theater. And um, that was only worth seeing me because it's fun to be seeing in tights, I think. And uh, then uh, I started directing sort of hole in the wall theaters there, like 99 seat houses. And I had some success there, uh, a big hit. I directed Bents and that was a big hit for Washington. And that sort of moved me up. Um, and I was seen uh, by uh, someone who recommended me to Hal Prince on Broadway. And then uh, I worked uh, under Hal for several years uh, on a series of different plays of Vita, Phantom of the Opera, and a series of other plays, uh, which toured the United States, as you may know, for a long time. And that sort of got me into New York and moved me there. And I started uh, directing there at Circle Rep uh, as part of their director's lab, and then also the studio theater and started working on Off-Broadway. Uh, and then I sort of decided to jump ship. I, I had started working as an AD or PA and then AD in commercials in New York uh, to make some money. And uh, I got accepted as a directing fellow at the American Film Institute in Los Angeles. So I sort of jumped out of New York and went to LA for the first time. And that brought me there and I did my uh, fellowship there. Um, and that got me into LA. So it was like starting again because LA just didn't give a rip about my theater credits. It didn't mean anything to them. And so I started working as a PA and then sort of worked as an AD and sort of, uh, and I started directing commercials there and ended up directing quite a few commercials. And uh, that sort of uh, got me into producing films. I started doing, producing some films as well. Uh, somewhere around there, I ran the film program at UCLA Extension. Um, and then right after that, I moved my family up to Seattle just because I didn't want to raise my children in Los Angeles, sorry. And uh, that was a very good move for them, but it really meant that my directing career was going to take a bad hit because you just, you have to be in LA to get that directing work, shaking hands and passing out scripts and doing whatever you do. So I started writing. Um, I started directing up here, but the money wasn't that great in Seattle. So I started writing plays and 
after a lean couple of years, I sold a screenplay and then I sold another one. And that's how I really make my living now is working as a screenwriter. And I also teach. And somewhere in there at UCLA, I started teaching and uh, love to teach and teach directors and writers and actors. You come across as very much an actor's director because of the fact that you took those acting classes and it, it got you, gave you the opportunity to, to get actors and, and understand actors and understand that, that side of it all and what, mm -hmm. and which obviously allows you to, I would say, be a better director. Um, and also another thing, uh, you mentioned that you, you were a PA and I love the fact that, you know, you kept it in the family as far as like continuing to work in the industry. Um, because I always believe like, you know, it's, it's always a good thing to, um, know all aspects of the industry that you're in. And if it's, the, if it's an industry that you love so much, why not try to keep it within, within that genre? Because you're, it may not be what you want to do, but at least you're, you're still in the mix there. Well, I think you're right. And I think all art feeds all art, you know, so back in the days of the uh, Chelsea Hotel in New York, you know, uh, Warhol and all those guys and gals were painting and filming and writing and acting on stage. So I just want to live a creative, fulfilled life where every morning I get up and I'm happy to do what I do. And the idea of going to work in a cubicle was not going to make me happy. Like, you know, I had that TV show on PBS for years and it was The Artist's Toolbox. And it was a great show because I, I mean, it was the dream job because I got to interview the greatest artists in the world about what they did. So John Legend and et cetera, et cetera. And, and just every one of them said the same thing. They just said, I didn't want to do anything else. I really couldn't do anything else because I spent so much time when I was young doing my art. So then I committed to doing my art 24 seven and then I got really good at it. And when I got really good at it, the money started to come. And mm -hmm. that's what you sort of find, you know. So I agree, I just, you know, I teach, I write, I'm a photographer, I direct, I uh, do a little acting, not too much anymore, but you know, it all feeds, I paint, it all feeds itself. And that's how I want to spend my time. Doing and even like when you were coaching me, um, you would always talk about like what is art and you would always talk about like different kinds of art I remember in I was like in middle school and you were talking to me about what I was learning in art history class And we actually would have discussions about that before diving into our acting lesson And it's always brought a real joy and love of art and I'm always so fascinated When I see a piece of art even if it's not in a museum You know all of us are here on this earth to teach each other that that's why we're here and all the characters in our plays and our movies and our screenplays, we're all created to teach to throw the lesson. So if we're just smart enough to listen to each other rather than fight all the time, but listen to each other and see what lessons are there. And when that comes to art, that's super important because what, what is the job of an artist is a really important conversation to have. Because if, if you're going to be an artist, which an actor is, then you better know what the job of an artist is. And even one of the many jobs of an artist is to, authentically express their point of view. That's one of our jobs. And so all of us have points of view, whether it's about politics or, or something else. And I think it's really important that we use our art every day to say, hey, this is wrong. This is wrong what's going on. And I'm gonna create a character to show you how wrong it is. And I'm gonna put that character in jeopardy and you're gonna empathize with that character. And then you're gonna realize a wrong is being done to that human being and maybe then you'll extrapolate that back out into the real world we live in and realize I got to do something to stop that. Exactly. So you're right. We do talk a lot about art in all my classes because it's all teaching me. Da Vinci's teaching us and, you know, Mozart is teaching us and Tupac is teaching us. They're all teaching us. Now, uh, real quick, John, you mentioned Tupac. Yeah. I love the fact that you did that. Um, a lot of times, negative stereotypes instantly click in people's minds when they hear Tupac or when they hear just any anything related to to hip-hop culture in general. I always try on a personal level to remind people that hip-hop culture, there's a reason why hip-hop exists. There's a, a beautiful story about where, where hip hop came from and the original reason why rap was invented and hip hop was invented. Um, Tupac is definitely one of those reasons because in essence, that was like the CNN of the streets. That was the news 
of the culture and it allowed people to have an opportunity to express themselves in a way where where you may not read about it in history books or see it in or, or see or hear about it in news stories. While Tupac had his entertainment side, he also dropped a lot of a lot of knowledge about life um, in inner city neighborhoods. I love your line that he's he's like the CNN of yeah. uh, hip hop. I mean, okay, so that <laughs> let's not make any mistake. I, I sort of dropped the Tupac uh, uh, sincerely, but also just to seem hipper than I really am. Okay, so let's just get that right out there. You, you, but I, you did good on that. I'm just going to tell you right now. You know, <laughs> I didn't want to create too many illusions, but the truth is, I believe it. And my young son, Mads Jacobson, is a really gifted musician who is totally into that hip hop world. And he introduced me to all that. You know, the real truth is guys like me, Tupac Miles will be from another planet to the majority of, of older white people. And we can see it in the Black Lives Movement. We can see it here in Seattle at the CHOP, you know, which is this autonomous neighborhood that the Black Lives Movement and others have sort of taken over. I'm watching all my white uh, privileged friends uh, including liberal Democrats, object to that movement because it's threatening to them. And it always occurs to me, you know, I grew up in D.C., which was a predominantly 70 percent black city. So that part of that culture was part of my life. And I'm really grateful for that. And but otherwise, I, I would have so little exposure to that world if it wasn't for my son or if it wasn't for my very liberal politics or for that background because they're just we, we just don't associate enough with each other. Tupac was an authentic artist. He could only write and sing about what he saw and what was painful to him. You know, I always say to artists, you have to go into the pain. That's where the truth lies, is in the pain. You know, like right now, this is super easy for us to have a conversation because there's no stress, there's no duress, we're all being polite, we're on our best behavior. But you know, that's not the job of an artist. The job of an artist is not to conform. A job of an artist is to shake it up, to talk about things that nobody wants to talk about. So that's what Tupac was the first to do, and there's been many after that, but he was the first in that culture to get real airplay, talking about what no one else wanted to talk about. And you can see my white friends in particular getting really upset with that language that hip hop was using. It just shows how little my culture understands that culture. So well, I think it's safe to say that art is always the thing that everybody gravitates towards, no matter what's going on in the world, in your lives. Uh, we use it when we're tired from a long day's work and we just want to chill out and watch a movie or we want to listen to music or we want to paint or draw something or, or even go into a museum and, and looking at uh, paintings and sculptures things like that. Now you obviously, my friend, come from an artistic background and we you know uh, your father was one of the premier architects in the world and, and, has, and has just that long uh, resume of being able to have uh, built for, I mean, King, Kings, King Hussein being one of them. Sure. Um, your father, uh, Hugh Newell Jacobson, um, has been able to also build for former First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy, a.k.a. Jackie Onassis, a.k.a. Jackie O, um, <laughs> as well as uh, Meryl Streep. He introduced me to, to great artists, and some of those just really taught me the importance of art and the importance of embracing what it is to be an artist so that we're not just, you know, because if you're chasing the money, don't go into art. Go into concrete. There's only two concrete businesses in Seattle. I think you can make a killing up here. But if you're that's not the reason, to be, and fame is not the reason to become an artist. The reason to become an artist is because you have something you want to say, and you're determined to say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all want to have a career, for sure, and we all want to make a living, and we all want a good living, I suppose, right? But that's not the reason. The reason is you have something to say, and you love doing it, and you're going to use your art to express your point of view of the world. And not everybody's going to love that point of view, but you know what? If it's authentic to you, most people will. And you do what you love. I mean, you know, the, the fact that you're that uh, designed and, and built all these wonderful either monuments or, or houses, mansions, you were like the U.S. Capitol. So with your dad's career, it, it provided opportunities to live internationally and meet a lot of influential people from all walks of life. How did those experiences influence like your view of our current world? 
I grew up in Washington, D.C., and I grew up in a time where in a given, it was very social, that world. And so in a, a cocktail party, you might see the head of the Republican Party, and you might see the head of the Democratic Party. You know, you might see uh, Tom Brokaw talking with Dick Nixon's left, right-hand person. It wasn't uncommon to watch party opposites, political opposites, socialize with each other. And I'll remind you, that is a time when Republicans voted for removing the vote for impeachment of Richard Nixon. They were coming across the aisle. That's a time when Republicans voted for the Civil Rights Act. That's a time when we saw parties working together, not always, maybe never in real agreement, but working together for the common good of the country. We have John Jacobson, Emmy Award-winning director and producer, creator, and host of the PBS series, The Artist's Toolbox. He's our guest today. And this is The Lightning Hour. I stabbed him. He's dead.
what drew you to, you know, directing as a path and, and bringing your autistic vision to life? A lot of us go into what we were good at first when we were young. Like, because when you're young, you just you don't feel good at anything. Everybody's better. Your sister, your older brother and sister are better at everything than you are. And you, you just, and then somebody goes, you're good at that. Really? I'm doing that. Okay, let's go. Directing was like architecture in some ways to me, wasn't it? Like I'm designing the look of the play. I'm designing what everybody's going to do in the play. I'm the head of the production, if you will. You know, so I think there were some similarities that way that sort of got me interested in it. Besides somebody said I was good at it. You know, and so that, I think, had a big effect. I mean, so as, as much as we like to talk uh, ideal, idyllically about art, and art always has this sort of nirvana feeling to it. Art is hard work. Art is showing up every day and doing your work. I write every day from 5.30 to 8.30, whether I have a script assignment or not. I write every day because it just makes my writing better. Even when I write crap, which I do sometimes, it just it's going to get better. My crap now is better than it was five years ago. It's still <laughs> crap. It's still better. Still. At least I'm writing. That's the thing. So actors have to be reading and watching and performing and doing workshops. And they have to be working all the time at their craft. Or one, and that's why like in LA or New York, you see top level actors in acting classes, even if they're just sitting in the back, they're watching to remind themselves of that foundation work all the time. You know, Uta's class always had like a maid. You know, her class was so cool because you'd have like, she taught in a theater. So there might be 150 people in the theater. All of us had paid, I think it was $10. And then four or six couples got to perform their scenes and they paid $50 or something. Hmm. And then we would just sit back and watch Uta work. And so that allowed like Whoopi Goldberg was there, Amanda P was there, Dustin Hoffman was there at different times, just sitting in the back watching these people work you know, just to watch Uta work, you know? So it's just, those people know it's hard work and you, you, you can't get through it with your looks. You can't get through it with your connections. You have to show up and do the work and you have to want to be the best. You just have to drive yourself. So I, I think I got that from my dad too. Um, you know, uh, we, we, as artists, we always remember our firsts in this industry, uh, no matter what it is, you know, and it, it, especially as actors or as directors and whatnot. Uh, for yourself, do you remember making your first film and, and the lessons? What, what are some of the lessons that you learned from that first time experience? Well, there's a lot of lessons. I mean, I worked in so many different levels from PA to AD, directing, um, you know, acting a little bit. But, you know, you got to know your stuff. That's something you know, when I coach directors, sometimes they, rather than going to graduate school, for instance, I'll just say, just stay with me for a year and I'll show you how to direct a film. And we're going to just go through that whole process once a week. We're going to meet or twice a week and we're going to walk you through that, much like I did with Rochelle. Um, so there's passion and desire, which is everything. You can't be there for the wrong reasons. And I've worked with a lot of directors that are there for the wrong reason. I learned very early that I had to really stop futzing with the props and I had to stop futzing with her hair on the set. That wasn't my job. And what that was doing was distracting me and taking my energy away from the very thing I had to pay attention to, which is the performer. The only person that can talk to the actor on the set is the director. Writers can't talk to the actors, producers can't talk to the actors, only the director. And yet when I'm on young sets and watch young directors, they're out there moving the set pieces around and talking to the lighting people. That's not where your attention should be. You hire great DPs and gaffers to do that lighting for you. And you hire great qualified set prop people to do your sets. Let them do their job and let them be artists in their own right. Your job is to make sure that, I like to say the directors have really have to know three things. They have to know text. So we have to be script experts because if the script doesn't work, that movie's never gonna work. So it's all about the script. We have to know about performance. We have to be able to talk the language of the actor and to motivate great, honest performance out of our actors. And they have to know editing. They have to know how to cut those images, which they designed to edit and cut the performance so you get a movie. Somewhere along the way, I learned that my job was no more important than anybody else's job. And so after every rehearsal, just accidentally, I just started thanking everybody from the PA 
with a handshake to the gaffer, to the craft service, to the actor, every actor. And I, that was a great lesson learned. I, I just remember gaffers looking up or the PA looking up and I was coming up to shake his hand at the end of a 12 hour day. And thanks for your work today, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you, it was really great, you worked so hard today. Because one, it made everybody feel appreciated. It made everybody feel like a team. And then in those days where I needed overtime, where I needed a 14 hour day, no problem. Everybody stood up and was willing to do that because they knew they were part of a team effort, not just one ego guy's effort or whatever. Everybody in that room is an artist. And that's what's so important. And, and when, you, when you take their art away from them, they're not gonna do their best work for you. I, I think it also gives a, 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 an overall respect for the craft as a whole. A lot of people want to, going back to what you were saying in terms of people want to get into the business because they want fame and fortune, but they, they're, not, they're not understanding what business they're actually getting into. And if you respect the craft as a whole and realize excuse me, realize that it's not all about just picking up a script and saying a few lines, you get into doing the theater, you get into taking the classes, learning the history, knowing why you're saying what you're saying, knowing why those PAs are there, knowing why those lights are hitting you. It, it develops a more overall respect and it, it, it makes, it, it brings out, a, I think, a better performer in you and it, sh it shows. You can tell one from the other when you have that. And that's that, you know, I'm a child of the theater also. And, and it's, um, it's, it's I, I can't imagine a career not being a full-fledged career Without. You know, that's exactly, exactly what they teach us in Russia. Uh, and my teacher, Marina Kaidalova, she's brilliant. And she, she, told, she always told us, she said, you have to be able to perform in front of deaf foreigners who cannot hear you and who cannot even read your lips. And if you move them, if they understand what's going on, that's your win as an actor. Then you yep. do a great job. Yeah. That was a great lesson because intention, uh, my acting friends, is everything. Being clear on your intention is everything. And playing that intention committed is everything. Move into telenovelas. You know, again, we were talking thousands of times with Rico and Rochelle about how many movies and TV shows from here didn't make it to Russia. But, well, Mexican telenovelas is a different story. <laughs> So I watched a lot. They were on our television. So we know that you had an opportunity to direct telenovelas in Mexico. Is it true? Uh, and can you say what were that? Maybe I know a couple. I'm, I'm of curious. You're like CIA agent. You're like I haven't talked to anybody. But to tell me. My gosh, it's great. We're, uh, we're hitting you with the tough questions, John. So just to be clear, I didn't direct the telenovelas. I was hired as a consultant to come oh, okay. down to uh, Mexico City with Televisa and Univision and uh, improve their soap operas, their telenovelas. So those are their big shows. Like sitcom night comedies are our big shows here. The telenovelas are their big money makers at uh, Televisión, so uh, Televisa. So they hired me to come down and then my job was to work with actors and, and their directors and um, their set people. But this is so interesting. It's gonna be fun for me to talk about that because <laughs> in America, we shoot episode to episode. We shoot our soap operas, like here's episode 27 and this is what happens in it. And here's the script and the actors take the script and they can memorize it and they come to set and there are the sets and we just shoot them out. But, and, and those soap operas can last for years in America. But in Tele Televisa, the Univis at the uh, uh, soap operas there, they only last like nine weeks or 19 weeks. So they have a short run to them and they never come back. They build the living room set and then you shoot all 19 episodes of the living room sets back to back. So you don't shoot an episode in its entirety. You come in that day and shoot the first seven living room sets for episode one, seven, 19, 23, 48. So I was watching, I was back there watching the actors who were really gifted and beautiful too. They were beautiful. Young Mexican people are so gorgeous. Oh my God. And they were working and I'd be back there and every line was like this. I'll say it in English, but of course they were speaking Spanish. Like, where did you go last night? I was worried about you. I'm very lonely. And I say, huh, but they all speak with that pause. 
Well, yes, because they need to hear their lines. What? Yeah, there's a booth over there. There was a soundproof booth with a, a woman or a man with a microphone reading their lines to them. I was very <laughs> lonely last night. What? Yes, because they can't memorize the scripts because they're shooting, today they're shooting nine different scripts, which have, they don't even know what's happening. The director goes, okay, so since the last episode, your mother was killed, you you have grown a new leg, and you're living in Paris, right? Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> that were you last night. Right. Really, you watch them. They're all, ha and they all have them. They're upstairs, upstage here, an earwig, so they can hear the line. You try acting that way. So no wonder the acting looks so bad. I was sort of like, oh, no. But <laughs> it was more economical to shoot their sets out that way. Then they could just tear that set down and put the bedroom set in and shoot all the bedroom scenes. Wow. But the actors never knew what was they were really doing. They had no given circumstances beyond what they heard that day. They were just sort of told what happened in the prior moment. They didn't know their lines. They were just told their lines. So, they had, so of course, it always looked so shallow and, and surface level and overacted as the actors tried to commit to, you know, the acting where they just had no circumstances oh, to play. Great. So funny to watch. But that was a great gig. That, was, that lasted like seven years, you know, on and off, back and forth, trying. And I brought great directors down from American soap operas. You know, I would contact them and set designers, and then they would teach and show them their tricks too and things like that. So it was a great, and uh, being in Mexico City with Mexicans who worked at Televisa, who are my uh, translators and sort of guides, I became great friends with them, still am friends with them. And uh, they just showed me Mexico City like you've never seen it. That's, really that's a great behind the scenes story, John, because, you know, it, it, here in America, you know, there, there's a lot of running jokes of, of over, over dramatization of, of a lot of telenovelas. But to hear, and not to say they don't exist, but, but, but to hear the, that behind the scenes story where there's, there's a, it's a thing in the ear, and they're speaking like this because nobody can see it. I, I don't think a lot of people know that. So that's 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 such a nobody great. Nobody knows that. Yeah. So amazing to me. I mean, plus they're Latin, so they have that heightened emotion anyway. But you know, uh, and it's a soap opera, so you know, forty people are going to get killed in the first half hour. So you know, yeah. or get divorced, or have affairs on each other, or something. <laughs> I remember I was like 12 or 13 when you told me those stories. So probably, you know, like six, seven years ago, you know, hearing about it. And I remember being like, wow. And then um, anytime I would see a telenovela, I, I, I was always thinking like John told me about that they're waiting for their line. And then especially with the, um, with the show Jane the Virgin, when they're doing the style of telenovelas, of course they don't include that part in there. But of course I'm thinking... That's the st That's part of how that style is the way it is. And most people wouldn't know or understand that that is partially why it's that way. Yes. And like your hair is perfect right now, Rochelle, because we can just hide the earwig right in your ear. You never see it. I'm just my lines right now. Yeah. That is really interesting. Now I want to watch some telenovela to say, ah, they know now what you're doing. Maybe. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll never look at it the same way again. <laughs> to that moment when you talked about being a member of Big Brothers Big Sisters. And for our audience, if you didn't know, it's a community-based uh, mentoring program, right, that matches young people uh, predominant, predominantly from low-income uh, families with a volunteer mentor. So um, could you tell us a little bit more about that experience? Uh, I'm so glad to talk about that because that might be one of my greatest adventures, really. And that's a really good example, example, Rochelle, of you think you're going to go in there and lead like a director does or a teacher does, and you think you're or a parent, and you just walk out of there humble, humble by those kids. Because they're young, in my case, like they're usually eight years old. You're not with them for a long time. In some cases, I was with them. I'm still friends with a couple of them. You know, they're going to grow up and move on. But they teach you so much about love. And they teach you so much about commitment. Like I remember one young guy, Daniel, uh, at first you're only allowed to see them at school because they don't know you. And, the, you know, they're, they're careful about who, where they allow those kids to go as they should be. But then as, after a while, the mom will give permission to you and the school will give you permission to take them off campus and so 
uh, I took Daniel, I think, to play basketball on some court. And he was young. He was like eight. And we play hoops together a little bit. I could only play an eight-year-old, believe me. He's still beating me. And um, then I, I, I said, I'll take you home now. Show me where you live. And so he took me to the, his neighborhood. And then we kept driving around. And he kept giving me directions. And I finally realized, you're not telling me how to get to your house, are you? He goes, no, I don't want to go home. I just want to sit and talk. And he's just having me drive around the blocks. So I pulled the car out, you know, finally got to his house. I said, I have to have you back when I say I have you back, you know, to your mom. And so I pulled in front of his house and I said, okay, I'll see you next Wednesday. Okay? And he said, so you're going to come next Wednesday, right? I said, yeah. You're really going to come, right? Yeah, I told you I'm going to come. But see, this boy never had a man show up when he said he was going to show up. So he didn't believe I was going to show up. And he really reminded me of the importance of when you promise something to a child or to anybody, you deliver on that promise. Because if I disappointed him once, he would never trust the man again. You know, so it, you just leave. He got out of that car and I just cried and cried for empathy for him, of course. Because I had a dad who showed up. My mom's a different story, but my dad showed up. You know, and I was determined, he just taught me a big lesson. Like you have a big responsibility when you take a, a young life on. You have a big responsibility. You know, you gotta show up. You can make mistakes, you can screw up. All parents do, but you gotta show up. And kids know that. Just don't stop coming. Just keep showing up, I'll forgive you. you know? So I, was, I just recommend it to everybody, really. It's such a great experience. They, and we'd, I'd be at his school, and I'd be at one of the kids' school, and they'd see me talking to him or play chess with him or doing his homework with him. And they'd say, you're a big brother, right? I'd say, yeah. He goes, I want a big brother. Let me have a big brother. They all were just hungry for somebody to hang out with. You know? And you weren't their dad, so you didn't have that personal connection. You were like a friend. And you could give really friend advice without being too personal to it. Well, you can do that if you want. I just don't think that's going to pay off for you very well. But if you screw up, I'm here. We can talk about it. You know? So I just, I hope it helped, but I think it did, and, you know, but it's a powerful experience. It's really great. All of us. How, how long were you with the Big Brothers? Eight, uh, oh, uh, 12 years. I might go back and do it again, actually. You know, I can't do it now because of COVID, but it's just so valuable. You know? And it, let, it definitely lets you cross cultures because we talk about cultures of being a skin color thing. It is to some extent, but it's also a class thing. It's a money thing because we have our tribes. You know, you, you belong to this tribe and he belongs to this tribe and you just don't know what that other tribe is. So those other tribes can be scary to each other until you sort of mix and realize oh, they're all the same. They're just wearing button down shirts or, you know, t-shirts. There's no real difference. That always makes me emotional, but in a, in a really great way. I remember the first time I actually think I met one of, I think, I might have been Daniel because that name sounds familiar. I think I, I yeah. remember meeting him. Yeah, I remember meeting him. I couldn't remember his name earlier, but yeah. yeah. And he um, right. yeah, he was awesome. You and know, he's got a baby and he's all really? grown up. And he's oh. a great dad. He just shows up his kid all the time. It's so cute. I went to, um, back in November, I went to a gala for Big Brothers, Big Sisters, the Big Bash. They had it in LA. They had it um, the Beverly Hilton. And so... I went there and they asked me like how did I know about the program what my connection was and I talked about you being a part of it because I, I currently don't have any but when I was in there and I'm in that ballroom and I'm listening to so many stories and I'm meeting so many people who have those stories who have gained so much from it I'm like okay yeah in in a few years I'm yeah I want to do that because Rashida, you'd be such a great uh, big sister Pia my wife was a big sister too before really me. Yeah, so it, it, you just never forget it, really. Wow. It's just, it will reward you your whole life. I'd love to. It sounds, Good. yeah, it Good. sounds amazing. John, I want to briefly talk about your skills as a photographer. Do you have the same cinematic view for photography as you do for directing? And if so, how do they differ? I know there's obviously some similarities, but um, in terms of capturing that moment, capturing that, that shot. Well, of course you, you do. You know, of course, when you're directing a movie, you're you're really focusing on what the human drama is in front of that. And you know, the the truth is, it, it's it's not hard to make pretty pictures. 
um, like that sunset, you know, sunsets, all photographers look at other photographers' sunset shots and they go, okay, you don't have to do that much work. Nature's doing 90% of it for you. And of course, when we're making a movie, we might have sunset shots, but that's not gonna be a very long movie. We, we need something to happen in front of that sunset. And that's where the real work is. So, you know, typically when I'm directing, what is the mood I'm trying to get? What is the tone? And your, your picture quality affects that. But really, it's what's in front of that picture, what's in front of that beautiful picture that's, and, and you know, Hollywood makes beautiful pictures all the time because they have a lot of money. So they can make almost anybody look really beautiful in, in sunset light and things like that. That doesn't make a good movie. Pretty people don't make good movies. I mean, they don't hurt them, believe me, but they don't help them. What makes great movies is honest human drama in imaginary circumstances, trying to figure out how to solve the problem and, and empathetic characters, you know, and people we care about. I always say stories about, get me to like somebody and put them in trouble. Just get me to like somebody and put them in trouble. And I'll watch the movie because, oh no, that little girl's in trouble. Oh no, that guy's in trouble. That dog's in trouble. Woody's in trouble, right? So we'll turn the page to see that, you know, he does, he becomes the king toy again. So, uh, photography is different though because still photography I'm alone I'm a subject forever and I, I don't have a clock usually ticking and I can really create pretty stunning pictures both on the set and then in post so I view them quite differently you know I really view my cinematography I don't, I'm not a cinematographer my film work as I'm going to I'm going for a certain mood, which I communicate to the cinematographer and it's his or her job to create that for me, then I will definitely use my photography eye to see if that's the look I want. But most of my focus on that set is on performance. But to me, it's all art and it's all creating. Like I took some stunning shots of a tulip today. I got the camera inside the tulip and backlit it and it's just like fantastic. I'll put those up at some point. But. Uh, that just that experience of creating and just seeing the wonder in front of you and seeing how you can use your skills to play with that image is really fun, really fun. How can people find your work? And also if they want to look you up on social media, how can they find you? Uh, my website is my name. It's John E the letter E, which is my middle initial Jacobson, which is S E N. So John E Jacobson. Dot com and my photography's up there, my classes are up there, my lectures. I lecture around the country a lot. The story is up there and things like that. Um, so that's fun. Um, and then I'm on Facebook, of course. So just find me on Facebook here in Seattle. I'm a friend of Rochelle, so you know, fishing into her account for me. Um, and also, could you give a quick shout out to your classes where people can go and study with you and how you're doing it over and during COVID? <laughs> Uh, sure. So we're doing all the classes on COVID now. So if you want to study with me and we can do it on Zoom, which means you can be in LA or wherever you are around the world, as I have quite a few students who are doing that, uh, you can just email me at jjdirect at me.com. John Jacobson, Amy and multiple awards winning director, writer and producer, creator and host of the national PBS show, The Artist Toolbox, teacher at the University of Washington, private coach and mentor. Thank you so much for being here, for sharing your stories, your experience, and your wisdom. Now, that's so nice of you, and I had a really good time with all three of you. You're really great to be with. Thank you. Thank you.